Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 through 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife had, hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Hi, my name is Cynthia, and I'm here to share with you the gospel, which is the good news. We see a lot of crazy happening in our world today, and a lot of evil, and a lot of pain and suffering. But we don't have to despair. We are children of God. Jesus is coming back soon in a pre-tribulation rapture, and he's going to rapture the bride, which is the church. I've had a lot of people argue this, um, saying the bride is not the church. We're the children of Jesus. We're, we're not the children of Jesus. That is not true. We are the children of God, yes, but we are the bride of Christ. Um, before we get into this topic of Christ coming for his bride and why he's called, why, why we're called the bride of Christ, um, we're going to share the gospel as we do in every video. It's the most important message that anyone can ever hear. And if we don't tell you and we don't share it, share this with you, then with the world, then how will they know? How will they hear? <sighs> Within the recent past, the very recent past, changes have occurred with surprising suddenness. Governments once, once thought to be stable um, have toppled. <sighs> Financial institutions have failed. Once successful businesses have collapsed, and even more significant, the moral fabric of society has been shattered by turning away from God and the principles of his word, the Bible. The do-what-feels-good mentality, casting off restraint and rejecting authority, has broken up families and ruined lives. There is nothing but lawlessness, the essence of sin, which has brought the disillusion, disease, death, and destruction that we see all around us. When Jesus Christ prophesied that he would return to earth, he was asked what the signs of his second coming would be, and he replied, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places, and all these are the beginning of sorrows. Matthew 24, 6 through 8. We're seeing these things today. In 2 Timothy, um, verse 3, we read about the time of apostasy or falling away. This is the result of people deliberately rejecting the truth about who Jesus is and what he accomplished on the cross of Calvary. Evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. This time has already begun. Uh, and the rapidly increasing rejection of God will soon bring a swift change. Instead of God's grace being offered to all people so they may be saved, his judgment will fall upon this godless world of unbelievers, leading to, the, to eternal destruction. To escape God's judgment upon sin, you need to be changed. The Lord Jesus desires to change you from death to life, from darkness to light, from sin to salvation, from judgment to glory. To enable this change, he died on the cross for you. There he suffered once for sins and just for the unjust, the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. The work is finished, and sin's penalty has been paid. 
God proved he was satisfied with the work of Jesus by raising him from the dead. The Lord lives and now declares the way by which you may be changed. If you um, are doubting the resurrection or you don't believe it to be true, look at some of the new evidence on the Shroud of Turin. Now, I'm not saying that the Shroud of Turin is, is real or authentic, but the evidence would stand up in a court of law. It would stand up in court. Um, if you need proof, look at do some research and look up, look into the Shroud of Turin. It's very eye-opening. But Christians don't need proof. We believe. And our belief isn't just, I believe in Jesus. It's knowledge. We know. We know it's real. We know what God did for us. We know what Jesus did for us. And we will never change our minds. Once you've accepted Christ as your Savior, your your eyes are opened and you see you see his goodness and his grace and his mercy so what must you do to be changed first of all the lord jesus declares unless you repent you will all likewise perish luke 13 verse 3 and verse 5 to repent you will um, to repent means to change your mind as to the wrong course you are following without God. It means to accept his verdict that you have sinned and come short of his glory, and you can do nothing to save yourselves. Romans 3.23 and Titus chapter 3, verse 5, you must repent. You must change your way. You must believe in Jesus. He says you must be born again. In John 3, verse 7, new birth is a spiritual birth from above, from God. It is brought about by receiving Christ as your Savior. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. John chapter 1 verse 12. To receive him is to believe on him. Believing he died for you and rose again makes you a child of God. You receive everlasting life and thus become a completely new creature in Christ, um, in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This is the change you must have, or else you will perish in eternal separation from God. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and be changed while there is still time. Flee from the wrath to come. Luke 3, 7. Now is the accepted, um, the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 7. Um, there's bad news for good people. Do you, I mean, how often do you swear? Only when you're angry? Every other word? Do you get drunk or use drugs? Do you, um, do you lie or steal? Do you have evil thoughts? If you think you are good enough to meet God, there is bad news for you. According to the Bible, none of us are good enough to enter heaven. We've all fallen short of God's standard of perfection and are separated from God by our sin. Um, Isaiah 64 verse 6 says, We are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness or good deeds are like filthy rags. There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seek after God. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 through 11. Hebrews 4, 13 tells us all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. God requires an account of what is past. Ecclesiastes 3, 15. By the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in God's sight. Romans 3, 20. Acts 17.30 says, God now commands all men everywhere to repent. Luke 13 verse 3 says, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And Revelation 20.15 says, anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Once you realize 
you are not good enough, there is good news for you. God desires to have a relationship with you. In fact, he loves you so much that he has made the way for your sins to be completely forgiven. And this is the best news you will ever hear. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have eternal, everlasting life. John 3, 16. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. And Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8-9 through 9 says, By grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, verse 1. And Luke 10, verse 20 tells us, Rejoice, because your names are written in heaven. If you're trying to be good enough to earn heaven when you die, then I have to tell you very plainly that the Bible has nothing but bad news for you. Heaven cannot be gained through our good deeds or merit. If you're trying to live up to God's standard, maybe it's time to check God's word. The simple truth is that all have sinned and are under God's condemnation. Romans 3.23 and John 3.18. But once you know that you are guilty before God and lost and without a doubt going to hell, then the Bible surely holds good news for you. Jesus died for you on Calvary's cross and rose again to offer you a pardon for all your sins. His love reaches you just as you are. If you turn to him in faith, you will know the forgiveness of your sins and have the assurance of eternal life. You don't have to get neural, get a neural link. Um, or upload your brain and your consciousness into a computer. Those things aren't going to last anyway. All you need to do is believe in Jesus and you will have eternal life. The truth is, we all are immortal. Not in these bodies, but Jesus will be resurrecting us. The believers and the church will be resurrected during the rapture. Everyone else will be raptured at the end of the seven-year tribulation. To, um, at, actually, at the end of the um, thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. And they will face judgment, the white throne judgment of God. And if you don't have Jesus with you, you will be thrown into the lake of fire. The Bible's clear. There's one way and one way only to heaven, and that is believing in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And he's promised us eternity. But where, do you, where are you going to spend that eternity? Are you going to spend it with Jesus? Or are you going to spend that eternity in torment, separated from God forever, in the lake of fire? That is really your only choice. Because we all need a Savior. And Jesus was the way, is the way, the life and the truth. There's no other truth. There's no other way. So just believe in Jesus' birth, his life, his death on the cross for your sins, his resurrection, and he's coming back very soon. Isaiah 54, 5, for thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. The imagery and symbolism of marriage is applied to Christ and the body of believers known as the church. The church is comprised of those who have trusted in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and have received eternal life. Christ, the bridegroom, has sacrificially and lovingly chosen the church to be his bride. Ephesians chapter 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives, 
just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless, just as there was a betrothal period in biblical times during which the bride and groom were separated until the wedding. So is the bride of Christ separated from her bridegroom during the church age. Her responsibility during the betrothal period is to be faithful to him. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2 and Ephesians 5 verse 24. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. At the rapture, the church will be united with the bridegroom and the official wedding ceremony will take place and with it the eternal eternal union of christ and his bride will be actualized revelation 19 7 through 9 and revelation 21 1 through 2 then i saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea i saw the holy city the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I truly believe that the new Jerusalem is where we will be living. Jesus went away and he said that he goes to prepare a place for us. He's preparing this place for us for 2,000 years. He's not just adding a couple of rooms to his father's home, to the, the mansions, um, the homes of God. He's building a city, and that is where we are going to live. In the eternal state, believers will have access to the heavenly city known as uh, New Jerusalem, also called the Holy City, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 2 and 10. The New Jerusalem is not the church, but it takes on some of the church's characteristics. <sighs> In his vision at, um, of the end of the age, the Apostle John sees the city coming down from heaven, adorned as a bride, meaning that the city will be gloriously radiant and the inhabitants of the city, the redeemed of the Lord, will be holy and pure, wearing white garments of holiness and righteousness. Some, have, um, some people have misinterpreted verse 9, to mean that the holy city is the bride of Christ. But that cannot be, because Christ died for his people, not for a city. He's building the city for his people. The city is called the bride because it encompasses all who are the bride. Just as all the students of a school are sometimes called the school, believers in Jesus Christ are the bride of Christ, and we wait with great anticipation for the day when we will be united with our bridegroom. Until then, we remain faithful to him and say with all the redeemed of the Lord, come, Lord Jesus. Revelation twenty two twenty. We are waiting for our blessed hope. The bride is full of allusions to God's people being his bride. In the Old Testament, the prophets often portray God's people as a beloved bride, who is also often an adulterous wife. God is seen as a faithful husband who pursues and wins back his bride. Um, his bride. He wins back his bride every time they leave, again and again. His um, God's love is strong, and steadfast and loving. For example, the book of Hosea portrays the prophet Hosea as being directed by God to remain faithful to a wife who was repeatedly unfaithful to him. This gives us a picture of what God is like in the face of our own idolatry. Read Hosea chapter 3. Jeremiah also contains imagery of God's people as a formerly loving bride who has now become a prostitute chasing after other men who use and abuse her. Read Jeremiah chapter 2. Ezekiel portrays the tender and generous love of God for his people, which is then thrown in his face 
as he watches her not even accept payment for her prostitution, but instead bribe other men, paying them to let her be with them. Ezekiel chapter 16, read it. Um, after showing the unfaithfulness of the people in dozens of chapters, Isaiah ends with a beautiful reaffirmation of God's faith and enduring love for his people. Isaiah 62 verses 4 through 5 says, It will no longer be said to you, forsaken, nor to your land will it any longer be said, desolate, but you will be called, my delight is in her, and your land married, for the Lord delights in you, and to him your land will be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so your sons will marry you, and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your, so your God will rejoice over you. Instead of giving up on his adulterous people, God himself came near as Emmanuel, who dwelt among us. In the New Testament, John the Baptist calls himself a friend of Jesus, who is the bridegroom, saying, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy, this joy of mine is now complete. John 3, verse 29. I love the book of John. Um, Jesus also calls himself the bridegroom when he was criticized for not enforcing the level of fasting that the Pharisees practiced among his own disciples, saying the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Matthew 9, verse 15. Metaphorical language can be mysterious. It is a beautiful idea that the church is the bride of Christ. But what does this really mean? Paul explains the mystery after giving instructions to Christians, husbands, and wives in Ephesians 5, 25-32. Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Just like the bridegroom loves his bride, God adores his church. He hasn't merely professed his love in words, but also showed it through sacrificial actions. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. The Bible is a love story about a brave prince who leaves his palace, his throne, everything to rescue the one that he loves. All the great love stories of the world echo this, this greatest of love stories. And just like a good husband acts, God's actions towards the church are always full of love. He nourishes and cherishes her in everything. She is not left alone. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. He has her back in Isaiah 58, verse 8. And he provides and um, in Philippians 4, verse 19, and protects her in all things. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. Just like a glowing bride dressed in a white gown on her wedding day, the church is portrayed in the Bible as washed and splendidly pure because of the work of Christ. Through, um, Though the church is made up of sinful people, redemption is a powerful restorative force that also looks forward to glory when everything wrong will be made right. 
when God sees his church, he sees her made whole and holy, gloriously and graciously, um, freed from the stains of sin and shining in the light of his love. And just as he demonstrated in the Old Testament through the prophets who portrayed God's people as a straying wife with an ever faithful husband, we can rejoice that God delights to cleanse his bride in an ongoing way when she stumbles. First John uh, chapter 1 verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As with so many aspects of the Christian life, there is an already but not yet element to the church's identity as the bride of Christ. This is the heavenly reality, but the wedding supper celebrating the eternal union of God with his people is still to come. As believers, we are told to await this feast with great joy and anticipation and to prepare ourselves. Revelation 19 verse 7 lets us see into the glorious future that is to come. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Revelation 21 verse 2 is reminiscent of the glorious moment in a wedding ceremony when the bride appears. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as, as a bride adorned for her husband. We can join with all believers throughout the ages, longing for our bridegroom's second coming, saying, Come, Lord Jesus. We are a part of the greatest love story of all time. And just like in all great love stories, we truly will live happily ever after, as Jesus has promised us. He's got some great, great things in store for us, things we can't even imagine. The writers of the New Testament, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, used more than 50 metaphors to describe what it is like to be a Christian and to be the corporate capital church. As a reminder, the church is the collection of all the people who ever trusted Jesus um, for forgiveness extending from the resurrection to the return of Christ. One of the most famous and important metaphors given to describe the church is that um, the bride of Christ. The implications and applications of this metaphor are towering. God designed the groom and the bride relationship to be the most special of all human relationships. You know, when Adam was in the garden, God said, it is not right that man should be alone. Well, his son, Jesus, is man, and it's not right for him to be alone. And that is why the church has been sanctified and redeemed and washed white and forgiven of their sins so that Jesus will not be alone. He will be with his bride, the church, forever. Marriage demonstrates um, to the world the beauty of Jesus Christ's relationship with his bride, the church. Because of this, one of the many towering tragedies of divorce is that the picture of God's unconditional commitment to his bride is smudged. Here are a few of the most important elements of the metaphor metaphor of the corporate church as the bride of Christ. As individual believers and as the church, we have an intimate relationship with Christ. This is a relationship that is closer than an earthly husband and a wife relationship. Jesus is the leader and director and guide for us, the bride of Christ. Jesus is the perfect husband and as such, he nurtures, protects, and provides for us. He has a vision to see us perfected, having no spot or blemish or wrinkle or any such thing. He is the husband who habitually and unswervingly acts for our well-being. 
To be subject to Christ means to voluntarily give the right to direct us and influence us. We can rebelliously refuse to be directed and influenced by Jesus, and that is both sinful and foolish. It is clearly in our best interest to give him full direction of our lives and give him full influence over our lives. To submit to him does not dis diminish us. It increases us. It does not rob us. It enriches us. Obviously, we were all lost. Why else would we need a savior? We were sinful, separated from the holy God of the universe, helpless to fix our state and hopeless in every regard. We weren't as bad as we could be. We can always be worse. But we were as bad off as we could be. Our condition could not have been worse. Nothing could have made our state more dire, depressing, and hopeless. However, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The just for the unjust. And because of that sacrificial death, he can now offer to us salvation through simple faith in him. Jesus loved the church and gave himself up for her. He gave his own life for the church. He sacrificed willingly and greatly. He loved us unconditionally, voluntarily, and despite our utter act of, um, lack of merit and total spiritual bankruptcy, Jesus' goal for us is our sanctification. Jesus wants us to be holy as he is holy. He wants us to be mature as he is mature. He wants us to be perfect as he is perfect. He has a lofty vision for us and our perfecting. Um, he is skillful, powerful, and tireless in his pursuit of this vision. We are not yet the people that God envisioned when he rescued us, um, but he is not giving up. In fact, the time will come when we will be exactly like Jesus because we will see him just as he is. We will be, because of his sanctifying work, holy and blameless and perfect and without blemish. We are individually and corporately on a collision course with Christ-likeness. What sane person wouldn't sign up for that? Jesus Christ cherishes the church. Cherishes mean he means loves. This is mind-boggling, but true. Too often, we view God as a cosmic killjoy who is itching for us to fail or sin so he can come down on us. We view him as being against us. We view our relationship with him as one of performance that leads to him dribbling out a little grace on us. And this model of relationship with God could not be more inaccurate. God is not against us. He is immeasurably for us. He suffered and died to save us. God is not itching for us to fail. He is acting for us to succeed and enabling us to succeed. God is not dribbling out grace. He is drowning us in grace. God is not um, dribbling out grace for our performance. Rather, we are making it our ambition to please him because he has deluged us with grace. Here is the great mystery. Jesus and his bride have a relationship of immeasurable intimacy. This is his doing, and we are incapable of undoing it. Um, it is a mystery, but a joyous one. We are married to one husband, and that is to Christ. For us, as individual believers and as the corporate bride of Christ to seek life or love or meaning outside of Christ is idolatry. Yes, it is foolish and fruitless and harmful, but foundationally, it is idolatry. It is a bitter betrayal of our groom and it is a bitter forfeit, um, forfeiture of our joy. He is the one he is the source of life and joy. In Revelation 21, 9 through 11, the church is called the bride, the wife of the lamb. As the church, the corporate church, 
And what do I mean by the corporate church? I mean, we are the temple of God. He lives within us. We don't need a building. The church is not a building. It doesn't have walls. We are the church. We are the bride of Christ, who is the groom. But we are here... Um, but we are here called the bride of Jesus, who is the lamb. Jesus, in not only the groom, but he is also the lamb who gave his life for our salvation. He was arrested, beaten, tried, and crucified. During this whole time, he refused to call 12 legions of angels from his father's presence to rescue him. He went silently as a powerless lamb to the slaughter. He was not powerless, not at all, but he went to death that way in order to rescue his bride. Once the lamb sacrificed for his bride and um, rescued her, she became a thing of glory and beauty and brilliance, like a very costly gemstone. Jesus was very clear about who his bride could become if he was, if he was willing to be the sacrificial lamb for her. He looked past the cross by faith to see her perfected and glorious. It was all his doing and all at his expense. To make a massive understatement, we, his bride, get a great benefit. God, when he destroyed the world, he didn't have to save anyone. He could have just destroyed everything and just started over. So why didn't he do that? It's because God lives outside of time. He knows the end. He's seen the end. He created time. He created the beginning and he created the end. He created time. And because he lives outside of time, he knows who is going to come to him. He knows who's going to believe in him. When he says he knows his sheep, he truly knows his sheep. He knows who's going to be with him in eternity. And he's decided that we are worth it. We were worth dying for. So he didn't want to just scrap everything and start over because he loves his people. He loves the bride. He knows who's going to be with him for eternity and he wants us. And that's a profound thought to have and to remember that he wanted you. The church is the bride of Christ. This is a metaphor with so much meaning and profound depth that we could never mind this depth completely. The truth is that all human brides and grooms deteriorate as they age. That is not to say that their value is in any way demised or that they should in any way be less loved. Truthfully, they should be more loved. It is only to say that our physical bodies do not have the youth, beauty, and vibrancy that they once had. At the heart of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, there is the greatest romance of all time, and this is how the gospel goes. The eternal Son of God left the company of his loving Father to go in search of a bride. The Son of God became human being with two natures, fully God and fully man, born of a virgin in a stable in Bethlehem. He grew up and drew great crowds after him. Lots of people loved him. They were fascinated by his wisdom and righteousness, grace and peace. His bride-to-be was not a beautiful princess, at least not yet. The bride of Christ was, a, was down and out. She was all messed up, dysfunctional, broken by sin, hurt and filthy, but Jesus loved her and would give his life for her. And that's what he did. Jesus died on the cross. He died a painful death for his bride. He died for her because he couldn't marry her as long as death, as a death sentence, hung over her head. She had rebelled against her loving God and deserved to die. The penalty for her rebellion and sin was death. And so the eternal God the eternal son of God, could not marry her until she could live with him forever. He had to die for her if he was going to marry her. His death and resurrection were his engagement gifts to her. He returned to his father 
to prepare the wedding feast and sealed his love with the Holy Spirit. The bride is the church, and with the help of her lover's spirit, she now prepares herself for her wedding day. Every follower of Jesus is a part of the bride. If you are a Christian, your goal in life is to be ready for your wedding day. Today, um, we're talk, um, today the talk that we're trying to have is how to prepare for that day. That's what we're talking about here. How can you prepare? Well, Revelation 19, 6 through 9 says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. In these last days, God is preparing a bride for his son. Who is the bride? The image of the bride begins in the Old Testament with Eve, who is a type of the church. Um, look at Genesis chapter 2, 18 through 24, Ephesians chapter 5, 22 through 32. In the New Testament, John the Baptist calls Jesus Christ the bridegroom and his disciples the bride, John 3, 29. Later, Jesus also refers to himself as the bridegroom in relation to his disciples, Luke chapter 5, verse 34 through 35. For just as God created Eve out of Adam's body, God created the church out of Christ's body. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 30. For when Christ willingly gave up his body and died on the cross for us, God performed a divine heart transplant and exchanged our sinful hearts with his son's divine heart. Romans chapter 6 verse 3 through 11. Just as there was a betrothal period in biblical times, between the bride and the bridegroom until the um, until their wedding ceremony. So the body of Christ is now betrothed to Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. Through water baptism, new believers declare their betrothal to their bridegroom, Jesus Christ, and their union with his death, burial, and resurrection. According to biblical customs, this betrothal is a binding commitment or covenant that can be broken only by infidelity. And by biblical tradition, the bride remains veiled until her marriage. After the second coming of Christ, the bride will be revealed. The wedding feast will take place and the eternal union of the Lamb of God and his bride will be con consummated. However, before this wedding can take place, the bride must make herself ready. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 and 21, verse 2. Jesus Christ made a number of promises to the seven churches in Revelation, um, and that would be chapters 2 through 3. Chapter 4 is the rapture. And then we're seen in heaven as the seven lampstands standing before the throne of God. Because Revelation, um, I believe it's chapter 4, verse 12, tells us the lampstands are the church. That's us. Um, these promises were not only for those earthly churches. They are for the church today. Like all of God's promises, these are too conditional upon the obedience of our faith. Christ said, those who by faith obey his spirit and overcome Satan would inherit his promises. He promised those who uh, would overcome, um, that who overcome, that they would have their names written in the book of life and be ready for their marriage and eternal union with him. Um, although the entire nation of Israel was called to be God's chosen people, most were unfaithful to him. When that occurred, God no longer called them his bride. He called them the harlot. Um, read Isaiah chapter 1 verse 21. But God's covenant promises were still fulfilled through his remnant of survivors or overcomers. 
in Isaiah 37, 31 through 32, um, many Christians mistakenly think that because of God's grace, they can love the world and have Jesus too. They are deceived. Christ will not marry a harlot. God's covenant promises to the church will only be fulfilled through his faithful bride of overcomers. We don't, we don't um, rely on our good deeds. We can only rely on the finished work of Jesus. It's not enough for us to zealously desire to be his bride. It is impossible for us to overcome Satan and sin by our own willpower and natural strength and zeal. Um, if overcoming depended on us, we would be defeated. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says we overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. The blood speaks of the triumphant work that Christ accomplished by his crucifixion. On the cross, Jesus destroyed Satan's power over God's elect. By his death, Jesus redeemed us from both the penalty of sin and the power of sin. The secret to overcoming is knowing we have died in Christ. When Christ died, our sinful nature died with him and was buried with him. Um, Romans chapter 6, verse 4 through 6. Christ lives in us. We are now raised with Christ and seated with him in victory. Therefore, the power of Christ's blood shed on the cross silences all of Satan's accusations and lies. We have an intercessor, an interse intercessor in heaven looking after us. The blood of Christ nullifies Satan's power to accuse us of sin. It also nullifies his power to arouse us in sin. Jesus is our high priest. The bride of Christ, who crushes Satan, wears the full armor of God under her wedding dress. Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 17 is where you can find the full armor of God. And it's important that we wear it every day. When Satan accuses Christ's bride of failing, um, of failing God, she stops his lies with the shield of faith and proclaims there is no condemnation in Christ. When Satan tempts Christ's bride to love her soul life, she uses, she uses the sword of the Spirit to make him flee and proclaims she is dead to the world through the cross of Christ. The bride who overcomes Satan knows she has died with Christ and is full of spirit and testimony of Jesus, her bridegroom. This is the bride who conquers Satan by the word of her testimony and by the blood of the Lamb, and she does not love her life even when faced with death. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren, of our brothers who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. Revelation chapter 12 verse 10. On his wedding day, Jesus will unveil his bride clothed in white wedding clothes without stain or blemish, holy and blameless and blameless. These wedding clothes are the righteous acts that springs from our faith in Jesus Christ and his victory on the cross. This is the bride who has proven herself worthy by her undying love and faith in Jesus Christ and his cross. When Jesus Christ returns and is revealed, this is the bride who will be revealed with him in glory. This is the glorious bride of Christ who will be joined in the heavenly marriage and eternal union to her true love and Lord, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. When the Bible tells us that we are not to love our lives, even unto death, what the Bible is telling us is that we need to be willing to give up our lives, just as Jesus did for our faith in Christ. It's that simple. We don't turn away from our beliefs. We do not turn away from Jesus. We do not deny him. We know the truth and 
we need to be willing to give everything up for that truth. <sighs> Revelation 22, 17 and 20 is awesome. In that day, the Lord of hosts will be a beautiful crown and a glorious diadem to the remnant of his people. And as the bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so your God will rejoice over you. Isaiah 28, 5 and Isaiah 62, 5. And the spirit and the bride say, come. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Revelation 22, 17 and 20. Um, in Revelation chapter 22, Jesus tells us he's coming quickly three times. That means he's coming quickly. You can believe him. Jesus is the light of the world, who was the Messiah. He personally came into the world to save his bride, the Church of Christ. Are you sure that you're a child of God? Jesus is extraordinarily matchless because he is God and the Son of God and a man, all rolled into one holy being. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of a virgin named Mary. She was overcome by the Spirit of God over 2,000 years ago, and the Virgin Mary birthed God as a human being during the summer months. God prophesied about himself in the person of Jesus Christ that he was the Messiah. In the Old Testament, Jesus, um, Jesus Christ is God, the Father's firstborn Son, our Emmanuel, God with us always. Jesus was born the Son of God, and Christ is eternal. Jesus never intended his birth to be celebrated, only his death, burial, and resurrection at baptism. Jesus has begun saving people who believe in him from their sins since Old Testament teachings. We do celebrate Jesus' birth. We don't know the day. We don't know the year. Most of us are wrong about the month, but the angels celebrated a heavenly host of angels celebrated his birth, and I do too. He came here. He left his throne in heaven, and that is important. His birthday is so much more important than mine. Um, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Luke chapter 2 verse 11 says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. The birth of Jesus is celebrated more in the Bible than any other birth ever. Many people were waiting and expecting the Lord Jesus Christ, a Messiah to save them from the damnation of their sins. And Jesus fulfilled every promise of God the Father and lived up to his God's calling. Jesus decided his calling before the foundations of the earth because he is mighty God. Pontius Pilate arrogantly crucified Jesus. Jesus died for his church to purchase our bodies from hell. Um, Jesus gloriously resurrected back to life and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus the Messiah was a Jewish rabbi who taught in Galilee for three and a half years. He grew his following and increased the number of members of his Church of Christ through parables and miracles John the Baptist baptized Jesus at the start of his ministry to make him popular in Jerusalem. And because it, at that moment, the Holy Spirit ascend, des, uh, descended on him and God was his voice was heard saying, this is my beloved son with which I am well pleased. Jesus lived for 33 years and was beaten and hung on the cross. 
he fulfilled the promise of God the Father and redeemed the bodies of God's children. Everyone is freely given the gift of immortality to live in eternity with Christ once they obey God and are baptized. Um, understand, you do not need to be baptized with water anymore. We're now we get baptized with the Holy Spirit, but baptism by water is wonderful. It's a wonderful confirmation. Um, it's a wonderful ceremony to publicly announce your faith in Christ. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what's needed today. You must learn to love your neighbor as yourself. It's a lifelong process, and surely all things work out for your ultimate good when you love God by obeying his commandments and by believing that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, you can, you can try your darndest to obey all the Ten Commandments and live a perfect, sinless life, but you will fail. So do not be discouraged because our Redeemer Jesus, our Bridegroom, he fulfilled that law for us. And now we live through faith in him. He offered himself as an innocent, holy sacrifice, a sacrificial lamb to save God's children, the bride of Christ, from their sins. He was whipped, spat upon, nailed to a cross, and he arose from the dead on the third day. Now, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, um, he wasn't in the grave for three days. Um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that's not three days. Um, he rose again on the third day, before that third day was completed. That is what scripture tells us. <sighs> Through Jesus Christ, everything came into being. And nothing without him was ever not made. God the Father created everything through Jesus. He was there in the beginning. <sighs> to, become a, to become a child of God, you must believe in Jesus. Repent of your sins. <sighs> Be baptized with the Holy Spirit. On the day that you first believe, the Holy Spirit will seal you and you will be sealed until the end. The scales from your eyes will fall off and the gift of the Spirit of God in your heart will guide you and lead you and protect you and give you perfect peace. John 8 verse 12 says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followed me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Today, Jesus is a, a mediator, a high priest of the church that he died for, the bride of Christ, the bride that he died for, the his precious bride. His job as the Messiah is over. He already saved everyone. It's up to you to believe, to freely receive salvation by your faith in his finished work. He finished his work when he was resurrected from Calvary's cross. His kingdom reigns on the earth. In a twinkling of an eye, Christ's bride will meet Jesus in the air. The entire world will go into the tribulation, thermal nuclear fission. Since time's not... Time will be no more. The earth will become a giant fireball. And God's children will forever be in heaven with the Lord. Of course, there's more, many more details on that timeline. Um, but if I wasn't a child of God, I'd be shaking in my boots, looking at the things that are coming on the world right now, and we're just in the birth pains. Jesus can return at any moment. Already, 2,000 years have passed, and how much longer do you think it will be? No one knows. You must live your life as if Christ is coming back every day. Because we don't know what day the rapture will occur. We don't know what year, but we know we are in the last days. We know this is the final generation. I believe he's coming this year. Maybe, maybe next year at the latest, but... We don't have a lot of time left to warn people. Luke 20, 27 through 40. 
is the resurrection and marriage. Some of the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second and then the third married her. And in the same way, the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be, since the seven were married to her? And Jesus replied, The people of this age marry and are given in marriage. And they, and they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children. Since they are children of the resurrection, but in the account of the burning bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. Some of the teachers of the law responded, well said, teacher, and no one dared to ask him any more questions. Today, many believe that death is the absolute end of life. This is not a new idea. The Sadducees rejected the idea of a resurrection, partly because their canon was limited to the, Pente um, the Pentateuch, and resurrection hope is found mostly in the later Old Testament writings and Judaism. They also denied messianic expectations, and so until Jesus came to the temple, their private domain, they were not interested in him. They also held to leverate marriage, whereby a brother of a deceased husband should marry his widow to preserve um, the inheritance, male descendant, and support for the widow. This leads to the question that they pose to Jesus. And their question seeks to expose the supposed stupidity of the resurrection hope, assuming that marriage continues into the resurrected state. While Jesus' response confirms the importance of marriage, as in all of his other teachings, he effectively rules out marriage after um, the end of this age. It will not be needed for the con continuation of human, the human line. Um, the resurrected become eternal beings, like angels, but even more, eternal children of God. We become the bride of Christ. And arguing from their canon, he affirms the resurrection since the God of the living is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the time of Moses still living and well after their earthly desires. Um, you can find this in Exodus chapter 3 verse 6 and Genesis chapter 25 verse 8. Um, this passage is both exciting and perplexing. While we are assured that believers will be raised to be with God forever, it presents a real dilemma for those um, who live in a love-based marriage. The thought of not doing so um, saddens a lot of people. Yet, whether we are happily married, single, long to marry but cannot, or have found marriage a real challenge, we are comforted that something exceedingly, even the greatest of marriages awaits us, the union of the Lamb and his bride, the church. For this great wedding feast, we press on. Matthew 22, 1 through 14. I want to um, leave you with some scripture. Um, I want to read to you 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 through chapter 3. And then we're going to look at the 10 virgins. Um, a few more scriptures. The word of God is alive and active and we need it every day. We're living in hard times. Jesus is coming soon. Whether you believe in the rapture or not, he's coming. And um, all the children of God will be raptured, whether they believe in the rapture or not. But the times that we're living in now is very, very difficult. There's a lot of deception. So let's look at a few more scriptures. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 4. I mean, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4 through chapter 3. 
for God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell, in gloomy pits of darkness, where they are being held until the day of judgment. And God did not spare the ancient world, except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. But God also rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a righteous man who was sick of the shameful immor immorality of the wicked people around him. Yes, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness he saw and heard day after day. So you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the day of final judgment. He is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire and who despise authority. These people are proud and arrogant, daring even to scoff at supernatural beings without so much as trembling. But the angels, who are far greater in power and strength, do not dare to bring from the Lord a charge of blasphemy against those supernatural beings. These false teachers are like unthinking animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed. They scoff at things they do not understand, and like animals, they will be destroyed. Their destruction is their reward for the harm they have done. They love to indulge in evil pleasure in broad daylight. They are disgrace and a stain among you. They delight in deception, even as they eat with you in your fellowship meals. They commit adultery with their eyes, and their desire for sin is never satisfied. They lure unstable people into sin, and they are well trained in greed. They live under God's curse. They have wandered off the right road and followed the footsteps of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved to earn money by doing wrong. But Balaam was stopped from his mad course with his donkey, um, when his donkey rebuked him with a human voice. These people are as useless as dried up springs or as mist blown away by the wind. They are doomed to blackest darkness. They brag about themselves with empty foolish boasting, with an appeal to twisted sexual desires. They lure back into sin those who have barely escaped from a lifestyle of deception. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption. For you are a slave to whatever controls you. And when people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and then get tangled up and enslaved by sin again, they are worse off than before. It would be better if they had never known the way to righteousness than to know it and then, rege and then reject the command they were given to live a holy life. They prove the truth of this proverb. A dog returns to its vomit. And another says, a washed pig returns to the mud. Now chapter 3, verse 3 through um, 16. Uh, yeah, 16. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again. From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command, and he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not forget this one thing. Dear friends, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. 
He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along, on that day he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him. Speaking of these things in all of his letters, some of his comments are hard to understand, and those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted his letters to mean something quite different, just as they do with other parts of the scripture. And this will result in their destruction. I know that Peter is a favorite of many, and um, his story is amazing. He walked with Jesus. He knows Jesus. I love, love Second Peter. So, I don't want to end this video, um, this Bible study on the Bride of Christ without talking about the parable of the ten bridesmaids. I'm sure most of you were expecting that. Jesus is coming and he's coming soon and we are waiting for him. And we will keep oil in our lamps, which is the Holy Spirit. We are looking for our blessed hope. We know Jesus is coming back very soon. But the parable of the ten bridesmaids is found in Matthew chapter 25, and it's um, verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the, bride ma the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. They didn't know when he was coming. They waited for him, but some thought he was coming much sooner and they expected him a lot. They didn't expect to need to wait very long. And so they didn't have any extra oil. They weren't completely filled with the Holy Spirit. They weren't ready. But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. So they left. The shout came, the bride's groom is coming, and they left. They didn't continue waiting. They ran out of oil and left. What does that tell us um, about what's happening today? But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, Believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. And this is a command from Jesus. You are to keep watch. You are to be ready. So with all of these people out there saying, oh, you, why are you looking into 
prophecy and end times and watching and waiting, we were commanded to do so by Jesus himself. You must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. It's interesting that the five foolish virgins left. The ones who weren't ready, the ones who didn't have enough oil, they left even after hearing the shout, the bridegroom comes. Look at the signs that we're seeing today. We see the tribulation being set up. We know he's coming. Jesus said, look up when you see these things begin to happen because your redemption draws near. How many people are getting discouraged and walking away? And then the rapture is going to happen and they're going to try to come back. Hey, I'm let us in. Come, They're going to be devastated to be left behind. They knew the truth and they did not believe. And when the rapture comes, when Jesus takes his bride, they're going to be devastated because they're going to know what happened. And they will become the tribulation saints who will die for their faith. You don't need to be here for that. Be ready now. Accept Jesus as your Savior because he's the only way. Don't wait it out. And he's not just here to save us from the um, tribulation. Although, trust me, that's a wonderful. I don't want to be here for that. So I am so grateful that Jesus will be taking me out of here before that. My name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I hope that yours is too. But he's saving us from our sins. He's saving us from eternity in the lake of fire. Don't wait. You're running out of time. And we're running out of time to warn you. I want to see you in heaven. <laughs>